Brethren in Christ, Laudato Jesus Christus in Secula. This is Timothy Flanders at the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. Today I'm joined by Dr. John Bergsma. Dr. Bergsma, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, it's great to be with you, Tim. If you don't know John Bergsma, he's a professor of theology at Franciscan University of Steubenville. He's a senior fellow at the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. He was twice voted faculty of the year by graduating classes at Franciscan University. He's a popular teacher whose love of scripture inspires students. And he is he got his Master of Divinity and Master of Theology from and served as a Protestant pastor for four years before converting to Catholicism in 2001 while working on his doctorate in theology at the University of Notre Dame. He specialized in Old Testament and Dead Sea Scrolls, and he's got articles and he's co edited with uh, Scott Hahn. And today we're talking about his newest course at the Emmaus Academy, which is on the major prophets. So we're going to be talking about, especially about Isaiah today uh, over at the Emmaus Academy. So you can click the link below. Uh, I've already done the first two sessions of your major prophets course, and I can tell everyone here that it's riveting. It is absolutely riveting. I was blown away, especially by number two on Isaiah. So it was fantastic. Amazing. Uh, so what? But before we talk about all that, uh, what's new with you, Dr. Bersma? Are you working on any projects, books, articles, anything? What's going on with you? Oh, yeah. There's always stuff going on. Um, super busy, uh, traveling a lot, speaking. Uh, Dr. Han and I are um, have, have been doing uh, kind of a Eucharistic-themed parish missions around the country, trying to support uh, the Eucharistic revival that the bishops uh, are are pushing. Uh, you know, leading up to uh, the Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis next year. Um, I've been working on personal projects, working on a commentary on Deuteronomy, uh, working on a devotional on uh, for Lent on the uh, 40 chapters of Exodus, uh, one for each day of Lent. Um, we're shooting that, and that's going to become a booklet as well. Um, working on some other book projects uh, also. Um, some short articles. So yeah, there's just a lot of irons in the fire, Tim. Oh, well, that's fantastic. I, Plus I, I teach. I teach and I also like make food for my family and stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you could squeeze me in, uh, Dr. Bird. <laughs> uh, so how, how can people keep keep abreast of your work? Um, is there like a newsletter on your website here? Um, <clears throat> that the, the new site, uh, the uh, website, johnbergson.com doesn't get uh, updated too much, but you know, uh, what folks can do is uh, go to the St. Paul Center website and um, and look at the St. Paul Center events because most of my speaking events uh, are now through the St. Paul Center. And you can see where I'm going to be around the country. Uh, you know, I was in um, Chicago land yesterday, going to be in Dallas tomorrow. Um, and uh, it's going to be quiet over Christmas, but then kind of back at it um, in the in the new year, especially because Lent falls early this year. And Lent is going to be super busy. So, yeah, folks can check out uh, events at the St. Paul Center, and, and uh, they'll see most of my stuff crop up there. Excellent. Fantastic. Yeah, so click the link below. You can sign up for the Emmaus Academy. It's just $25 a month, but it's it's this is college graduate level education formation in the scriptures and the Catholic faith. So it's definitely a, a deal at $25 a month. So um, this is a part of our lay apostolate series, which is where we promote the our, our annual Bible reader, which is, where is that? Here it is, uh, where we read the entire Bible every year according to the traditional office of Matins. And so there there is, the traditional office of Matins goes through a great deal of the Bible, but this plan we added in everything else. So you do go through the entire Bible liturgically. And that's why we're talking about Isaiah, because Isaiah is read in Advent. And right. if you want to join our Bible reading group, you have to be a part of our guild community. So you can go to meaningofcatholic.com slash register. And then you have to commit to our Fellowship of St. Anthony, which is the, the penances that we do. We got to offer up penances. We, we offer this up for clergy and seminarians as, as lay people. This is what we see as our roles, trying to help out uh, clergy to offer up penances for them so, after the imitation of St. Anthony. And that's what you need to do to be a part of the Bible reading group because you cannot approach the fire of the scripture unless you are uh, purifying yourself with prayer and penance. So. Um, so I, on that note, Dr. Bergsman, I wanted to ask you first. So we, we have, first of all, we have a short advent, which is a little tricky with this Bible reading. Cause you got to get through uh, on our Bible reading plan. We get, get through the entire book of advent, but this year we only got three weeks to do that. So, um, but Isaiah is a very long book. 
it's, and, and it can be very difficult to read. So do you have any spiritual tips to get through this book uh, at kind of a fast pace, really, at, in three weeks? That's about three or four chapters per day, six days a week. Any spiritual tips to get through this book in a profitable way? Yeah, absolutely. I think one you, you hit upon a key thing, which is that we need to be practicing uh, mortifications um, and self-denial. Um, that's just really, you know, come home to me again in the last couple of weeks as I've been preparing myself for Advent as well. Um, if we're not if we're not denying ourselves on a daily basis, what happens is uh, we become too attached to, um, you know, physical pleasures, carnal pleasures, and we lose that uh, taste for the Word of God. So we got to be saying no to ourselves. And, you know, St. Jose Maria had this great advice where he said, in, in all the areas of your life, you always want to keep some tension on the reins. You know, so you never just want to let your hands off the reins and let your let your body go. You know, you just want to, don't want to stuff your face. You don't, don't want to keep pouring yourself more drinks. You don't want to uh, just keep scrolling through YouTube, whatever. You, you got to exercise uh, self-restraint as, as, a, as a habitual um, disposition. And that helps us to develop a taste for uh, spiritual things. And then when approaching, um, you know, the book of Isaiah, you know, I would just uh, recommend uh, praying to the Blessed Mother before beginning your reading of that day and, and telling her, uh, you know, Blessed Mother, look, this, this, um, th this great book is beyond me, but you and your simplicity uh, were able always to, um, to get directly to uh, the meaning of God's word and, and ask her to lead you into those passages of the reading for that day that, um, that she believes is mo are mo most applicable to your heart. And uh, so bring the Blessed Mother into, you know, uh, get, her, get her as an ally as you're reading through this great book because Isaiah speaks about her. Uh, and of course, the fruit of her womb, and um, so she knows Isaiah well, and uh, and and she can really help in um, in in the appropriation of this book. Fantastic, G great, great idea. I love it. Um, so in your in your course, you you had one of the, mo the best definitions of covenant I've ever heard, which is that the covenant is a, a family bond ratified or or sealed by an oath, right. and in your 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 um, course you talk about how isaiah is a part of these major prophets and he's this fifth evangelist and this is i mean everybody kind of knows that because everybody's familiar with all these different you know a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and he shall be a manual you know um handles messiah and all that um so can you tell us summarize just some of the things that make the major prophets distinct and some of the things that makes isaiah distinct among the major prophets yeah yeah, so Isaiah tells us much more about the Messianic age uh, than all of the other prophets. Um, so, it, for example, in the book of Ezekiel, um, the description of the Messianic age is primarily in uh, chapters, uh, oh, say, 34 through 37. Okay, And in the book of uh, Jeremiah, the Messianic age is described primarily in chapters 30 through 33. But in Isaiah, you get um, you get about 27 chapters. You get chapters 40 through 66, plus major sections of uh, that are earlier than that, like Isaiah 9 and Isaiah 11 and some other key passages, Isaiah 35, for example. So you just have a lot more material that goes into the description of the Messianic age. And you get a much fuller picture of this mysterious servant who kind of dominates the second half of the book of Isaiah. He keeps telling you about this servant and all this servant's qualities. And it's bewildering because um, sometimes the servant's qualities seem contradictory. He's spoken of as being exalted and yet marred beyond human, uh, human resemblance. He's spoken of as if he is Israel, and yet he's also clearly an individual sent to save Israel. And so it, it's it's challenging reading, but there's answers to all of those apparent contradictions. And of course, in hindsight, looking back from the revelation of the Christ, we can see that, oh, the exaltation is his lifting up on the cross, which is simultaneously his humiliation and his marring. And oh, 
he can be called Israel and yet also be an individual sent to Israel because he is Israel's sacred king. And the king embodied the people. The king was the nation, so to speak. L'état c'est moi, as uh, Louis the Fourteenth said, and and that's um, you know that applies to the Davidic Messiah. So, uh, so that's that's what's uh, one of the things that's unique about Isaiah is that he just provides, you know, I would almost say <coughs> more information about the coming Messiah and the Messianic age than maybe all the other uh, prophets combined. Um, because they all have snippets here and there, but he just has th these these long sections. That that's uh, amazing, especially as we enter the second half of Isaiah, c getting closer to Christmas. Um, but you just mentioned those two halves, and so I'm gonna. I, I have a few questions from our fellowship of Saint Anthony. This one's from Rachel. She says she asks, "Is the hypothesis of two authors of Isaiah generally accepted or taught in any authoritative sense? Is the idea of a later prophet in the school of Isaiah during the exile held by a majority of scripture scholars?" Yeah. Yeah, so I would say a majority of scripture scholars hold to multiple authorship, probably something like um, Isaiah, primarily responsible for most, but not all the material in chapters 1 through 39, and then another author for 40 through 55, and then a third author for 56 through 66. There are some notable exceptions, uh, like um, the Jewish uh, Bible scholar Benjamin uh, Somay, who... Um, who argues strenuously that 40 through 66 is all one guy. And I agree with him on that. In fact, for myself, I take the tradition. Um, I just understand it as all from Isaiah. Um, that's how it was read up until the Enlightenment. I'm not a big fan of the Enlightenment. Um, so I just, I, I camp out there. You know, I, I don't insist on that. If, if folks want to hold to multiple authorship, um, the church will allow that position to be held, um, but uh, but for for myself, um, I, I I feel greater theological safety with um, sticking with the tradition of the fathers, the doctors, and the Jewish tradition as well. Excellent. Uh, here's a question from G. He says, uh, "What are some insights about Isaiah that are not well known? What are some common misunderstandings about the book?" I guess you just mentioned kind of one. If 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 uh, we're talking about single authorship. Right. Yeah. Well, some of the things about Isaiah that are not well known, I guess, are the fact that he was really at the right hand of King Hezekiah uh, during a time period where Israel was quite literally at the center stage of world history. I think that, you know, we, we uh, you know, we, we think of Isaiah as, uh, well, he's a great figure in Israelite history and he's a great figure, you know, for the church and he has a spiritual significance. I guess what's not well known was that he was a major player in world politics because under the reign of Hezekiah, who, uh, who was perhaps the, the king with whom Isaiah was the closest, okay, Hezekiah was so strong that he, uh, during his reign, faced down the world power, if you will, the evil empire of his day, which was the Assyrian Empire. And, um, and he lived to tell about it. Uh, he fought the Assyrians to a stalemate. And because he went in and prayed to the Lord, and of course we have that, that famous account in chapters uh, 36 through 39 where um, Isaiah prays to the Lord and the Lord sends out a plague on the Assyrian armies that had surrounded Jerusalem and they were forced to, to break the siege. They retreated back to Assyria and then the Assyrian emperor was assassinated. That was all part of world politics, and that siege of Jerusalem actually shows up in a garbled form in uh, Herodotus, uh, the Greek uh, historian. So really, you know, again, talking about affairs that were at the center of um, world events of the day. And so I just I think that's valuable to know, to see that, you know, when we're, when we're talking about, you know, the great prophets of Israel, this is not something that happened in a closet that was separated from um, the significance of events of the day, but was really at the center of world history. And I think that gives us a greater appreciation of how powerful these men were. Isaiah was at the right hand advising Hezekiah at a time when Hezekiah was at the center of world affairs. So um, again, uh, you know, that, that gives us a perspective. And of course, you know, when we get to the Gospel of Luke, Jesus, uh, you know, is presented to us by, by, the, uh, by the Gospel writer Luke, 
as one who's born at the center of world affairs. And so the datings of, you know, the birth of Christ, the beginning of his ministry, Luke dates them to the reign of Augustus Caesar and Quirinius, the governor of Syria, et cetera, to make the same point that was, you know, that's, that's, that's latent there in the book of Isaiah, that, that salvation history is also world history. It's not like uh, we, we go off and hide while we do our sa saving acts, you know, but uh, it is really integrated. And this is a message for the whole world. Yeah, that, that's I was blown away by that when I heard that in your course. I didn't know that about Herodotus. Um, and that brings up one of the difficult things about the prophets is that they say a lot of names and places that many readers, including myself, are not familiar with. Um, what are some names and places and people? Um, you just mentioned Assyria, so the evil empire of the day. Um, right. What are some other names and people that we should know what they are so that we can help understand Isaiah better? Sure, absolutely. So Sennacherib was the uh, Syrian empire who emperor who came in and, and besieged um, uh, the land of Israel and uh, is, a, is kind of a central negative in the plot of the book. Um, other figures that would be helpful to know for understanding uh, the book of Isaiah would be um, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who came in and um, uh, subjected uh, the kingdom of David, the kingdom of Judah, to vassalage between about 605 to about 587 BC. And in 587, he had the temple destroyed and took the last of the people off into Babylonian exile. And um, Isaiah's uh, chapters 40 and on, some of those chapters do seem to be, from my perspective, be the prophet Isaiah speaking to a future generation that's going to experience that exile in Babylon. There's kind of a shift in the book of Isaiah up, up to about chapter 39. Uh, the central threat that keeps being mentioned is the Assyrians. And then from about chapter 40 on, uh, the, uh, the Babylonians become the major threat. So uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his successors got the Babylonian Empire, uh, so to speak, off and running, and um, they controlled uh, most of the Middle East from about 605 BC to about 537. And uh, there in 537 BC, there's another figure that we should know of that helps uh, to understand the book of Isaiah. That's Cyrus, uh, the Persian emperor. And uh, he also crops up in the Greek histories as well. Um, but uh, he overthrew the Babylonians and replaced them as the world power. And the Persians uh, held sway over most of the civilized world from about uh, 537 BC to about 330 BC when Alexander the Great uh, swept through. So that's about a 200 year um, a period of time. And some of the latter oracles of the book of Isaiah seem intended in, in at least one of their senses towards uh, the people of Israel who uh, would live under Persian rule um, and, and come back to their land far in the future from the perspective of, uh, of Isaiah. But Cyrus himself is mentioned by name in Isaiah 45. And um, of course, um, uh, many secular scholars don't believe in the possibility of predictive prophecy. So seeing his name appearing in that chapter, they assume, well, this had to have been written after the date, uh, you know, because we kind of rule out in advance uh, the possibility of the supernatural. I'm not a priori opposed to the possibility of the supernatural. So uh, I accept that as uh, as truly prophetic. Um, but he's mentioned there and it's it's helpful to know who he is. He's this Persian Empire who emperor, excuse me, who overthrew the Babylonians and reversed the Babylonian policy. Babylonians tried to keep peace by, by, um, by exiling all their subject peoples and make them weak and put them in places where they were uncomfortable and that were not their homes. Uh, the Persians were much more genial when they took power. Uh, they, they reversed that pol policy and said, let's send everybody home. Let's make everybody happy. Uh, let's everybody, let everybody worship in their own land. The only thing they got to do is pray for the emperor and pay their taxes. And as long as they do that, we're good. So people were much happier under Persian rule. Excellent. That, that's a really helpful uh, demarcation here for Isaiah. Um, here's another question from Rachel. She is asking, um, how 
how did the discovery and study of the great Isaiah scroll at Qumran also ha how has it affected both theological and literal understanding and interpretation of Isaiah? Yeah, great question. So the great Isaiah scroll is uh, kind of the, the finest piece of the whole collection from uh, the Qumran scrolls. And uh, when it was discovered, um, it was just a, in an amazing state of perfection. And the, um, the photos that were taken of it back in 1948, still amazingly beautiful. But what the Great Isaiah Scroll is, is a complete copy of the book of Isaiah from chapter 1 through 66 in Hebrew. Um, by some forms of dating, like carbon dating, it goes back to the 3rd century BC. So it's our oldest complete copy of certainly a book of the Old Testament in the original language. And uh, to my knowledge, it's the oldest complete book of the Bible, period, uh, that we have. Um, and so for all those reasons, it's just an amazing uh, cultural treasure. Um, one of the things that the Great Isaiah Scroll showed us, though, ironically, is it showed us the value of the traditional Jewish text of the book of Isaiah. Now, the traditional Jewish text is what we call the Masoretic text. It was a... a um, a stabilized form of the Hebrew of Isaiah that was perfected between about uh, AD 700 and about AD 1000 by the Masoretes, who were a scribal movement that lived around the, uh, the Sea of Galilee. And they had an amazing philological ability for the Midi Mid uh, Middle Ages and, and devised incredible uh, techniques for writing down vowels and other sounds that we make with our mouth when, when we are pronouncing words to a degree of sophistication that was not excelled until the 20th century in modern linguistics. And so these medieval Jewish scribes really did a lot of work on the text of the Bible to perfect it and correct it and make it accurate. And they really did a great job. And, and Tim, what, what indicates this is that when scholars began to compare the great Isaiah scroll with the traditional Jewish text that we had always had around, they discovered, you know what? The traditional Jewish text, ironically, looks older than, than this third century uh, text from the Dead Sea Scrolls. It looks older and, and really better because there were some passages uh, that are missing from the great Isaiah scroll where uh, the scribe made a mistake and like, you know, dropped his, his eye dropped from one word to another word and, and, and he skipped a paragraph in a couple of uh, situations. And so as beautiful and as amazing as the great Isaiah scroll is, Ironically, its primary value to the textual study of the book of Isaiah has been to confirm our confidence in, in the work of the Jewish scribes of the Middle Ages who did this scholarship to kind of perfect the biblical text. And they really did, uh, uh, um, you know, just a fantastic job. And so, you know, the, the text of Isaiah as we have it in its traditional form really looks like it, it kind of preserves um, like an 8th century form of Hebrew going back to the prophet Isaiah himself. Wow, that's that's very fascinating. Uh, excellent. I, I just have two more questions from our fellowship, St. Anthony. Um, so last one from Rachel. She says this. Um, as we know, Advent is primarily about Christmas, the nativity, but it's also about the second coming of Christ, too. So um, how does Isaiah sort of weave together the first and also the second coming of Christ? Yeah, that's a that's a great uh, question. You know, the way this was taught to me in seminary, our our my, my seminary prof who I had for prophets often talked about horizons of fulfillment. And he used this analogy, like if you're in Denver and you're looking West and you see, you know, the ranges of the Rocky mountains from that distance, all the ranges blur together and you just see this, this blue line of peaks, you know, now when you approach them, however, you begin to see that, Oh, you know, there's actually what we have here is layers of peaks that are behind one another. And what looks like, you know, one, two-dimensional wall is actually, um, you know, separated by uh, some considerable amount of distance as they line up one behind the other. And so this is an analogy of how the prophets looking forward in time uh, saw events, but oftentimes those events were kind of um, uh, telescoped onto one another. But as you approach the fulfillment of those events, you see that, oh, actually we have multiple events going on here that are separated by some time. And so sometimes in the prophets, like the first and second coming of Christ are, are um, compacted onto one another. And as we approach, of course, we see a distinction. 
But the prophet Isaiah speaks really about both. I would say primarily about the first coming of Christ. Most of what is said about the servant of the Lord, for example, in chapters 40 through 66, really applies to, to our Lord and his earthly ministry. There is some elements of that that look forward to the end of time, like kind of the eschatological vision at the end of Isaiah 66. But then also um, earlier in Isaiah's book, in chapters 24 through 27, we get what's called uh, the Isianic Apocalypse. And if you read those chapters 24 through 27, you'll be struck by how much they sound like the book of Revelation. And in fact, Revelation draws rather strongly from uh, the imagery in Isaiah 24 through 27 and reapplies it, uh, you know, by St. John uh, the Apostle in his in his own vision of the end of time. So I, I would say you, you get both uh, the end of the world and the second coming uh, predicted in Isaiah primarily in chapters 24 through 27, and then also the first coming of our Lord in, in so many different places, Isaiah 9, Isaiah 11, um, uh, in, in 40 through 66 as well. And then the way that Advent is set up, you know, the first week of Advent is always dedicated really to the second coming, which is kind of the same theme that we end the liturgical year on. So there's kind of a nice segue between Feast of Christ the King into the first week of Advent. And then it's in the second and third weeks of Advent that we actually focus, ironically, on John the Baptist, not Jesus himself, but on John the forerunner. And some of the oracles of Isaiah, um, you know, are, are quite interesting because they they speak of a voice or a herald who seems like he's the precursor of the servant of the Lord. And of course, that's a, a speaking of uh, John the Baptist. And so those readings from Isaiah will come up in the second and third weeks, really not till the fourth week of Advent, which we basically don't have at all. We just have the fourth Sunday of Advent coming up. And then, uh, and then Christmas is the next day. So we've missed that whole fourth week, unfortunately, this year. But that's the week where we start looking at the events uh, immediately prior to the birth of our Lord. Excellent. Fantastic. Thank you so much. This is I, I, I'm so excited to continue your course on the major prophets. Uh, so one last question for you uh, from Nicholas, and that is about your conversion from a Protestant pastor to Catholicism. Uh, one of the things that we are promoting with this lay stality is trying to show fellow Catholics that the lay readership of the Holy Scripture is a very Catholic thing to do, even for lay people. The church has been promoting this for 500 plus years since they've been printing vernacular Bibles. Uh, before that, there were all these Bible stories, plays, uh, art, everything is very, being biblical, so, so-called, so is very Catholic, and right. the Bible is a Catholic book. So um, what what kinds of, like, tell us a little bit about your conversion. Um, it, did the Bible, wh what did the Bible have to do with that conversion? <laughs> yeah, I laugh because I've got a book called Stunned by Scripture, How the Bible Made Me Catholic, okay? <laughs> There we go. <laughs> yeah, with OSV. Uh, so, um, you know, I like to say I, w I was converted to the faith by a Bible toting Catholic. Okay, I ran into this guy, Michael, at the University of Notre Dame, and um, he totally blew me away because he was full of the Holy Spirit. He was highly intelligent. He was Catholic. And I didn't figure how you could get all three of those qualities in one person without creating an explosion. But here he had all those qualities. Uh, to me, you see, the issue was I thought, how can you be, be spirit filled and smart and stay in the Catholic Church? Would you not realize that it's a false church and leave? So he absolutely fascinated me. We, we got together. And what really started to draw me into the church, Tim, was that Michael was able to defend uh, Catholic teaching from Scripture. And when he first began to do that in our conversations, I was actually literally taken aback and angered. I, I felt like he was doing something unfair, that you know, this was this was not this was unjust. You 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 ought not to defend the Catholic faith from the scripture. That was against the rules. It was rule breaking. It was an underhanded tactic. You know, this is how I felt. And, and, and when I analyzed it, I was like, well, that's not rational. Of course he can, you know, anybody's free to use the Bible to defend whatever they want, want to do, but it was a gut reaction. You know, I felt like, you know, felt my, it was my emotions feeling like this was unfair because of the way I'd been raised and, and to a certain extent brainwashed against the Catholic faith by my Calvinist upbringing. But that, that really impressed me, especially one time when, um, 
when Michael, when I challenged him uh, to defend uh, Mary, Queen of Heaven from Scripture, he just went straight to Revelation chapter 12 yeah. and started to point out that there you've got this heavenly queen who gives birth to uh, a male child who's clearly the Messiah. So how can you deny the possibility that that has some kind of pertinence to the only woman who gives birth to a Messiah that we know of in Scripture? I was kind of really quite impressed by that argument. Even though sometimes in Catholic circles, the relevance of chapter 12 to the Blessed Mother is denied, even by some Catholic Bible scholars, and I, I really object to that, I think that there's no way that you can deny that chapter 12, in some sense at least, there's multiple senses of Scripture, but in some sense is speaking of the Blessed Mother. So that was very influential for me, Tim. Um, but what, what really um, uh, was the straw that broke my, so to speak, Protestant back uh, was when Michael brought in the testimony of the church fathers as well. And when I saw that even the earliest church fathers understood the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, which suffered and which was raised. That's a that's a virtual quote from Ignatius of Antioch. And of course, he was a disciple of the, of the Apostle John. And so it went from Ignatius back into John chapter 6, and it dawned on me that Ignatius was accepting John 6 in its plain sense. And that really blew me away because I, I thought to myself, there's no way that anybody ever read this in the plain sense. But no, actually Ignatius, who knew the Apostle John, took it that way. And, and that was a hallmark of orthodoxy in the early church. And when I realized that the early church would have considered me a heretic because I denied the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, that was that was the end of the game. I was like, this is intolerable. intolerable. I must, if, if the scriptures say it's his body and the early fathers accepted that it was his body, who am I to disagree with the authors of scripture and the earliest martyrs of the church? I have to get in line with them. And if only the Catholic church accepts and, and continues to teach and uphold the real presence, then I must become Catholic, if only for that doctrine. And of course, all the other doctrines fell into place after that. But it, it began with the Eucharist. That was was convinced me that I had to become Catholic. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Bergsma. It's been fantastic. I am uh, once again, go sign up for the Emmaus Academy um, and uh, you can get the full course, the major prophets to put Isaiah in the whole context and uh, go to stpaulcenter.com, look at the events. Look at Dr. Bergsma's next speaking event. So, with that, let's, uh, as you say, let's let's invoke the Blessed Mother on our Bible reading, and then we will uh, invoke our patron, our lay patron, Saint Anthony of the Desert. So, Dr. Bergsma, can you pray the second half of this Hail Mary? Absolutely. All right. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Anthony, pray for all clergy and seminarians. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is King. Amen.